Hello everyone everywhere, Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God, we're so blessed that you're joining us here today. We're blessed every time we get together around the Word of God. Amen. And it is so exciting to, to come to you through the power of the internet, touching 160 plus nations all over the world, all 50 states here in the United States. You know, this ministry has continued to grow as, as you continue to listen and, and share these links out far and wide. And that's what we ask you to do. Share this out on your social media. Let everyone know that you're listening to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God. And today we got something special. Amen. We're going to be talking today about the answer is in you. And what does that mean? Just stay tuned because we're about to find out. Amen. Glory to God. And first, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. We'll get started in today's Bible study. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for the blessing of being in the body of Christ. Children of the Most High God, heirs of God, joint heirs with you of all things, knowing that you hear our prayers. And since we know you hear our prayers, we have the confidence that we receive the petitions we desire of Thee. Father, we pray for Your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct this conversation today. And we thank You that someone somewhere this day would receive Jesus as their Savior because of this broadcast. And to You we give all honor, all glory, all praise, and all things at all times, in all circumstances, because Jesus is Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly called the Apostles' Creed. We do this each and every week to lay the solid foundation uh, upon this Bible study that we're going to be building on. We don't want to build it on sand and, and stuff that's on stable. We want to build it on the solid foundation. Amen. So it is so important that you repeat these words out loud with me. If you're in a situation, a public setting, something, you don't want to you know, stand on the tabletop yelling at the top of your lungs, that's okay. Just loud enough for your own two ears to hear you. It is so important. He faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Amen? So just repeat these words after me. We'll get started. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. <laughs> but the third day he rose again from the dead. Glory to God. He ascended up into heaven and is seated right now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he is about to return very soon to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Glory to God. Let me ask you, what do you need the Lord to do for you? Do you need the Lord to heal you? How about prosperity? Could you use more money? Well, the truth is, you don't need the Lord to do anything for you. He's already done his part. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's resting. He's done all he's going to do. Because you already have every one of your needs met. According to his riches in glory, through and by Christ Jesus. You've already got it, whatever it is. Now, this may sound crazy to some of you, I know. You may be thinking, you know, but I got a doctor's report to prove I don't have healing. Or you, <laughs> all my needs met. Have you seen my bank account, Brother Bob? Well, regardless of what your natural facts are, the truth is God has already given you whatever you need. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power has given to us all things, all things that pertain to this life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The only thing we are lacking is knowledge. Knowledge. Most Christians believe God can do anything, but many of them don't believe he's done very much. They live in a constant state of, of, of trying to get God to do something. 
You know, they're begging God to, to move through revival. Grow this church through revival, Lord. You know, healing. They need healing. They need prosperity and all of that. They run from meeting to meeting and conference to conference trying to get something from God. But the truth is they've already got it. They just don't believe they got it. That's the problem. The Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Now, this says, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, meaning it's already done. Has is past tense. You already have all spiritual blessings. They belong to you. So, asking God or waiting on God to bless you is counterproductive. It goes against the Word of God. And when you go against the Word of God, no wonder stuff's not working out for you. Think about that. Yet, okay, Lord, I'll say that. If I went and deposited a million dollars in your bank account and told you, I deposited a million dollars in the bank account. You know, oh, I don't believe that. And you never went down to the bank account to check. That million dollars is doing you absolutely no good. It's just sitting right there. But here you are, unable to pay your light bill, unable to, to buy groceries for the kids, but you got a million dollars in your bank account. Well, I just don't believe that. Well, then you sit there in the dark and starve, right? That's just the way it's going to be. How many stories have you heard of uh, someone who died, you know, and, and, you know, they were living a squalor life, and then during, you know, the probate hearings, come to find out they had like a quarter million dollars in their bank account. Why would he live like that? He had all that money in the bank account. Don't know. It was there. It was their provision. They had it. They just didn't know. How to use it, I guess. You know, I remember hearing a story once. There was this lady that uh, worked like 50 years for Queen Elizabeth, and uh, you know she, you know, taking care of her. You know, the she she basically worked in the palace, taking care of. You know, we'll call her a maid, put it like that, just to keep it simple. But she was doodly serious. It may not have been 50 years, maybe 40 years, but it was an extended period of time. And I remember this story. She, you know, retired and went down, you know, bought a little, you know, dumpy flat, you know, like a studio type of apartment. And that's where she was going to live out her days. And uh, she was sick, you know, she barely, you know, her pension was paying, it paid for the, the payment on the house and, and bought some food and kept the bills paid. But, you know, that was about it. And then she got sick and... She, you know, didn't have the money to go to the doctor, so she's just trying to, you know, heal herself and, and taking, you know, vitamins and things like that. She kept getting sicker and sicker. And finally it got to the point where, you know, the, they were calling the pastor in to, to minister to her. The pastor came in. He was, you know, talking to her, you know, praying for her. And he'd seen, you know, pictures of her with Queen Elizabeth and stuff on the on the walls and so, oh, you work for the queen. Oh, yeah, I worked 40 years there. And he's looking at some of these pictures, you know, and she had her pictures taken with other dignitaries, too. And, and, and this one frame certificate was her retirement, you know, about her retirement. And, and pastor's reading it. And he goes, do you know what this says? She goes, yeah, that's my certificate I got when I retired. So I just hung it up there. He goes, no, no, no. Do you Have you read it? Do you see what this says? I didn't pay that much attention to it. I just came home and hung it up. And he's reading it. And she had full health and medical benefits for life. She was to receive an extra stipend every month for you know expenses and things like that, in addition to her pension. She had not drawn one dime of that because she didn't know it belonged to her. She didn't go down to the doctor. She could have took that certificate down and said, I need to be treated. She, she could have gone to any medical facility, any hospital, and they would have honored that because it was an order from the queen. Okay, and But she didn't know. It belonged to her the whole time. 
She had worked for the queen for 40 years, had been retired like 10 or 15 years, living in that you know little flat, no health insurance. All that. She had it the whole time. She could have had the best medical care in England, but she didn't know it belonged to her because she didn't read the certificate. There are so many people just like that here today. They don't know what belongs to them because they don't read the Bible. I pray you're not one of them. You should be reading your Bible on a daily basis. Even if it's only just one chapter, at least you're getting the word in there. Now, you know, well, Brother Bob, I just don't have time for that. I, from the moment I get up in the morning, my mind's just on all this other stuff I got to get done. I got to work, blah, 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 blah. You don't have 50 minutes for God. The creator of the universe says, I'm here. Come talk to me. I don't have time for you. No wonder you're in trouble. Amen. The Bible says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, meaning it's already done. You already have all the blessings you need. So asking God or waiting on him to bless you is counterproductive. Yet the average Christian starts from that position. If they're sick in their bodies, instead of starting from by his stripes, I was healed, 1 Peter 2.24, or I have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in me, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Instead of that, they take the doctor's report. Or the pain in their bodies and say, oh, I'm so sick, God. Will you heal me, please? They start moving towards victory instead of coming from victory. Praise God, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. You've heard me tell this story before about how my granddaughter, or my daughter was pregnant with my granddaughter. And the doctor told her, you know, that there was no blood supply to the brain and, and he was going to send her to a specialist for her options. Now, Denise had taken a video down to the sonogram uh, so that he, she could show her husband, Chris, and, and if he was at work and not able to go with her and, and us, my wife and I, to show us the baby. But she came home crying because the video showed a distorted fetus. I mean, the head was shaped like a football. You could see the doctor moving the curse around doing these measurements and, and he had told her that Basically, there was no blood supply to the brain. And that uh, he was going to send her, make an appointment, send her to a quote-unquote specialist uh, who was going to give her her options. And we knew what options they were going to talk about. Amen. Now, I had just graduated from Jerry Savelle's Bible Institute, School of World Evangelism, that located in Fort Worth, Texas. I had just graduated literally two days prior to this. Yeah, from a word of faith school, it, the major emphasis was on healings, right? I knew the word, and I knew God would answer my prayers. I knew all my needs were met through and by Christ Jesus. The battle was from a demon, for sure, because he was trying to destroy the baby, my grandbaby, and destroy my faith that I knew God would answer my prayers, if he could take me off that promise, then he could destroy my ministry before it even got started. Amen. In addition, he was destroying my daughter's family. Now, when my daughter came home in tears, she told me that, you know, she's, because I asked her, what do you want me to do? Right? And she said, she, I, she believed if I prayed, God would heal the baby in her womb. But as the mother of baby, I had to get her to believe that if she prayed, God would answer her prayers. My faith was up for the fight. Hey, man, I'm, I mean, I was like a, a, a hungry bulldog looking at a bone just laying there. I, 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 I was ready to tear into this devil. But I couldn't because the baby was hers. She had to take that authority. I had to get her to the point where she could believe and take that authority. My faith was up for the fight, but hers wasn't. So I got out my Bible, and I opened it. We started, I knew the answers in the Word of God. Amen. And I turned over to John chapter 10, verse 10, where it says, The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Stop right there. I showed her, the devil is coming right now to just kill the baby, steal your joy, and destroy your family. It says so right here. Now, let's read the rest. 
but Jesus came so that we may have life and more abundantly. And I started with that scripture, and I went through about a dozen different scriptures that talked about healing. You hear Brother Bob tell you all the time, if you have a problem, find it in the Bible. A, a situation similar to yours where Jesus or God answered the prayer of someone who had that situation similar to yours, even if it could be like reference to it, you couldn't say, you know, my phone doesn't work and I'm lost, what do I need to do? It's not going to be in the Bible. But there'll be a situation where someone was lost and needed direction and God provided. So that's why I say you find something similar that could be used by you to stand on and you lift that prayer, that scripture up to God in prayer and that's where you take your stand, right? There's a story in uh, the Battle of the Bulge, World War II, where uh, 101st Airborne was being overrun by the German army. And this one PFC was digging this foxhole and someone come up and said, you know, what are you going to do when the Germans come? He says, this is it. This is the line. They will not get past me right here. He was dug in, ready for the fight. Right? And that's where I was at. And as we were going through these scriptures, I was trying to get my daughter Denise to that same point. But after I went through about a dozen scriptures about healing, example after example, where someone who needed healing and came to Jesus and asked, received it, about this time I could see the the quote-unquote, light go on in my daughter's eyes. I knew her faith had just ignited. Amen? And that's when we prayed. We prayed for complete healing, standing on the Word of God, binding the devil. And not 30 seconds after we said amen, the phone rang. Yep. It was the doctor's office. They had scheduled the appointment for my daughter to see this specialist Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. Now, this is Friday afternoon, probably about 3, 30, 4 o'clock by now. My son-in-law was getting off work. He couldn't take off work Monday without giving prior notice first. So I told her, well, I would go with her down to the doctor's office. Now, I also had a mini cassette tape recorder and a tape with healing scriptures on it. And I had her put that tape in and had her play it 24 hours a day until we went down to that doctor's appointment. Just stuck it in her waistband so the baby would hear nothing but the word of God concerning healing. Monday morning, we went to the doctor appointment. My daughter had brought the videotape with her, the one with the sonogram on it, and she wanted to record this one on there too. And as the doctor started to do the sonogram, it looked like a completely different baby. I mean, he was doing his checks, scratching his head, going looking at his notes, come back and measure some more, scratch his head, look at the notes, go back and measure some more. Finally, he turned around, and I mean, this went on for like five minutes. And I'm standing in back of him this whole time, praying in tongues under my breath. And then he just looks up and says, why are you here? And I told him, you know, that what my daughter was told. And he wrote, I know that. I, I read that in the notes. But why are you here? I'm not seeing that. This is a perfectly normal little girl. And that's when we knew she was going to be a girl. Amen. But that was, and when you see the video, it, it completely different images. So I turned to my daughter and asked her, what do you say, Denise? Either your other doctor totally messed this up, and he'd been doing it for like 25 years or so, I said, or God healed your baby in three days. Which is it? She said, "My God healed my baby in three days. And that's been our testimony ever since. Amen? Now, the best part, well, that, that's the best part, but another part of this story. When the baby was born, uh, it came time to dedicate her to the Lord, and I contacted the dean of the Bible school. You know, they were made aware of the situation as it was happening way back, you know, eight months prior to that or whatever it was. And I asked to have a chance to share this testimony with the first-year Bible students and dedicate her to the Lord in front of the class. And it'd be a powerful testimony of the power of God and why they need to pay attention because you never know when your first battle is going to happen. And he agreed. So eight days after she was born, we were in Bible school. And let me just back up just a little bit. About one week after our victory in the doctor's office, my daughter said, came in one day and she goes, I think the baby should be named Zoe. Now, this was the time the TV show Friends was on, okay? And Zoe was the ditz on the television show. And I asked, Zoe, why, why, why that name? Pick another name. But she stuck to her gun. She said, I just, believe, I just believe she should be named Zoe. Now, back to her dedication. The dean was holding her and about to pray over her and, and said, what's the baby's name? I replied, Zoe. 
He goes, oh, what a great name, Life of God. I thought, duh, you big dummy. You great Bible school graduate. How could you have missed that? I felt so dumb for not remembering that. But after the dedication, I went back home and thought about our scripture. The one we literally took our first stand of faith on was John 10.10. 10. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and more abundantly. That word life, when you look it up in the concordance, is translated Zoe. And that's the word that God gave to my daughter for the name of the baby. So the actual verse we were standing was, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have Zoe. Amen. Praise God. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. That baby girl just turned 22 years old. She's so beautiful, smart, as are all my grandkids. Yes, I'm a proud papa. Amen. But the point being, we already had the answer to our prayers. Amen. One time I was praying about my healing and it seemed like my prayers just, they weren't getting any higher than the ceiling. I ask God, what is wrong? Normally when I pray, I, I see the results, feel the results, immediate results. What's going on? And the Lord spoke to my spirit and he said, you're fighting to get healed instead of fighting because you are healed. Oh, okay. Hmm. I had to back up a minute and think about that. And naturally, God was completely right. You might say, well, I don't see the difference, Brother Bob. There's a huge difference. The Lord told me that instead of defending my healing, just releasing what Jesus had provided, I was trying to get him to do something. But he'd already done it. If you don't understand this, then I can guarantee you this is one of the main reasons you're not receiving from God right now. You need to get a revelation about this. Jesus has already provided everything you will ever need. You're blessed with, what's the scripture say? All spiritual blessings. All of them. You know, there was once a, a great Bible student that's back about Booty Bible College time. And you know, they had to do a research project, something like that. So he decided he was going to do a deep dive and do his research project on that word, all. And he studied for the whole semester all these like 30, 40 different resources and you know, the Greek, the Latin, the Hebrew, and all that. And he came to the conclusion. This great revelation that when you read that word all, it means all. Everything. Amen. Again, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Amen. But you're blessed with all spiritual, every single one of them. Praise God. And the key for me understanding these things was the revelation the Lord gave me from John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit and he moves in the spiritual realm. Think about this. Whether or not we see a physical manifestation of what he has done in the spiritual realm is really dependent upon what we believe and how we act, not on what he's done. It's not up to the Lord to heal us. He's already healed us, 1 Peter 2, 24. But he gave his miraculous power to us to release it in our bodies by faith. Faith in his word. I've got testimony after testimony, example after example after testimony and example of how this has occurred numerous times over the last 20 plus years in our ministry. This is not a, you know, that testimony about my daughter, that's just not, that's not an isolated thing. That's the first one. Oh, glory to God. And I'm telling you what? Every time I give her a hug, that faith is reignited in me because I know God answers our prayer. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, there's so many testimonies I can share with you. I'm not going to take the time to do that because once I start down that road, it, you'll just say, well, that's your, that's, oh, well, that's the only exact. No, there's numerous testimonies. People in hospice that I prayed for and went home for six more months. My own father, quadruple bypass surgery. They, were, they weren't able to treat his abscessed tooth. We prayed for him. He got born again. We prayed for his healing. He went back to the cardiologist, so the, the dentist sent him to the cardiologist so that he could you know, treat the tooth. He had to get medical clearance. And the cardiologist came in and told my dad, if I wasn't the, done all these sur the surgeon that had done all these surgeries, I never believe this. It looks like you have a brand new heart. Praise God. That's just a, 
one, two, three examples or whatever out of numerous dozens of examples like that. Amen. Faith works when faith is released. Your faith will work when you release your faith in God's word. Amen. Healing has already been provided. Finances have already been provided. Joy and peace, everything that you will ever need emotionally, has already been provided. If you're having a down day, if things aren't going your way, if things aren't going right, if you don't feel good, you don't need to embrace discouragement, despair, and hopelessness. No, you reject it. Yet, the, the average Christian embraces this stuff. Saying, oh God, I ask you to touch my body this day. Oh God, give me joy this day. Oh God, hear my prayers about my finance. Oh God, oh God, oh God. The Bible says you've already received these things. The logical question to ask then is, well, if I already received it, where is it? Well, let's go to the Word of God and find out. Amen. Galatians 5, chapter 22, verse 23. Hallelujah. It says right here, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, tempers. They're all in you, folks, if you're born again. It's right there in your spirit. I've had many people come up to me over the years and say, I just don't feel the love of God, Brother Bob. I just don't feel it. Would you please pray that he'd release his love towards me? And I say, no! Most people think that's a great prayer request, but it assumes that God is at fault because they don't feel his love. Now, let me ask you this. Do you breathe? Well, of course I breathe, Brother Bob, otherwise I wouldn't be alive. Okay, What are you breathing? Air. Have you ever seen air? No. How do you know it's there? Because I'm breathing. I, 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 no, 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 no. How can you say you believe in something that you haven't seen? Can you touch it? No. Can you put it in a bottle? I mean, you can, but can you then see it and observe it? No. How do you know it's there? Because someone told you that's what it is. The Word of God's the same way. How do you know you're saved? Because the Word of God says so. That's the only, that's the only acceptable answer. When you got born again, Hey, Lord, when you were born again, it was because the Bible said so. Ask Jesus to come into your heart, right? And if you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved, right? That's what the scripture says. That's what you stood on. That's what you believed. Faith is an act of believing the word of God. And therefore, you asked Jesus into your heart, and you believed he answered your prayer, forgave you of your sins, recreated in you a new spirit man. You have everlasting life within you, and you know when you die and leave this, this earthly realm, you will be with him in heaven. You believe that. When you asked Jesus to come into your heart, was there suddenly like a new set of clothes on you or something that, that you could then walk out and show everybody, see, I'm born again? No. How do you know? By faith. Amen. So, the same thing with the example about the million dollars in your bank account. It's there. I told you it's there. You just don't believe it. Now, if you had faith, well, Brother Bob's never lied to me. Let me go down to the bank and check. And you walk in and say, can you give me the balance of my bank account? Oh, there's over a million dollars in there. Okay, you just verified the word that was given to you. And now you know it's there. And you can access it at any time. It's there. That's what the Word of God is. Once you get it inside of you, it's there. All you have to do is access it. Praise God. Whatever the need is, access that Word. You can do that by going back to the Scriptures. The Scripture, that, as I said, applies to your situation. And you stand on that Word. It's all, the answer's already in me. Oh, praise God. I got the answer. I release my faith to see the answer. Praise the Lord. You're not begging God to send you the answer. You're not begging God to, to do that. 
Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. They're all in you if you're born again. It's right there in your spirit. I just don't feel it, Brother Bob. The truth is, God has already poured out his love towards you. Look what it says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which has been given to us. God loves you whether you feel it or not. He loved you before you were born again. His love has been poured into your heart, in other words, into your spirit. His love isn't conditional upon your good actions or your holiness. You've got to start from this place that God has already provided everything, even if I don't feel his love. It's not that God didn't give us his love. It's, it's that I don't realize what I have. When you know you have something, it takes the struggle out of it. You don't struggle with it anymore. When you know you have something, it's yours. It takes out the condemnation. It takes you out of the legalistic mentality of trying to, to earn things from God that you've already got. It removes all doubt. How could you ever doubt that you're going to get something that you already have? I mean, it's really that simple. I can't explain it any simpler. You know, here's another example. Praise the Lord. Give me a second here. All right. Because of the pandemic this past year or so, my invitations to go speak obviously have gone down. But on those occasions where I am invited to speak somewhere, and I, I pray about what we'll be talking about in a session, just like I do here in those radio programs. But sometimes I'll be preaching on this topic. And what I'll do is I'll just walk over to someone as an example. And I'll hand them my Bible. Here you go. Here's the Bible. And they take it. And I walk over to the other side, you know, maybe 10 feet away or so. As a, what would I do if you asked me right now to give you my Bible? And they're sitting there holding the Bible in their hand. I say, you asked me to, you know, Brother Bob, could I have your Bible? And they're sitting there with it in their hand. And it's, I say, how would I respond? I'd probably look at them and just be totally quiet and give them that look like, really? Is that what you're asking me? Right? Why? Because they already got it. They have it in their hands. Amen. Somebody just got that right there. Don't shut me down when you're preaching good, Brother Bob. Many Christians, when they pray for what they've already got, they're getting total silence from the Lord. Why? It's because God's already given them what they needed. If they just open their Bibles and read their Bibles, find scriptures dealing with the situation they're facing and read them, they'd find out God has already provided the answer to them. He's already answered their prayers. Oh, Lord, uh, please save me, Jesus. He's like, I already did. I already did that. I'm not going to go to the cross again. Read your word. Oh, but Jesus, if you just die on the cross again just for me, I know it'd be for me. No! He's not going to do that. Man, I hope you're getting this. If God could be confused, which he can't, by the way. I'm just using this as an example. If God could be confused, I think he'd be confused saying, I told them in my word that they are already blessed, already healed, already prospered, already had total joy, already had peace in their spirits. Why are they asking me for what they already have? Why do they keep coming to me and asking me to come into their church services when I said I'd always be in the midst of two or three of them? Why do they keep asking me to go with them when they go somewhere when I said I'd never leave them or forsake them? See, we do this unconsciously thinking we're being all spiritual. How many church services have you been in? <laughs> when you said... Let's pray that uh, God's presence, was, presence would fill this place right now. You mean he's not in your church service to begin with? you got to try and get him to come inside? That's counterproductive, don't you think, pastor? 
well, now we're just saying that to get everyone to, to be spiritually minded and all in one accord. They should have done, been doing that because of your prior teachings. They should be spiritually minded and all in one accord. Well, you know, that's just kind of what we do. Yeah, I know that's kind of what you do. That's why your church is so small and you're, you're broke. And well, Don't get me going down that road. I repent of that, Lord. There's so many things we do out of habit. So many things we just do out of habit. One, because that's the way we were taught. Two, that's the way we've seen it done by so many other people in the past. And three, because we want to be spiritual in our approach to this. Go back again to Ephesians 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He has already done it. He has already done all he's going to do. When... I'll use, since everyone enjoys sports and most people enjoy football. And they're running this play, a big pass play, say a Hail Mary pass to win the game or something. Where does the quarterback throw the ball? Does he throw it to where the receiver is at? Or does he throw it to where the receiver is going to be? It's the latter, right? Is the receiver in position yet when the ball is launched? No. What if the receiver, instead of going deep, decides to turn left and cut across the field? Where's the ball end up? Way down the field where he was supposed to be. Right? And that ball just falls. And incomplete pass. Didn't work. And everyone says, oh, that Hail Mary didn't work. Oh, God did not answer our prayers. He answered the prayer. He put that in the mind of the quarterback. The quarterback said, yes, I will obey. And he launched that ball to where it was supposed to be. But there was confusion. There was doubt. And the receiver didn't go where he was supposed to be. It works the same way. God has called the play. God knows the plan. He's given you the plan. He's given you the play he is calling. And he has sent the blessing to be where you need to be when you receive the blessing. But you decide as you start down that field, you know, it looks a lot better over here. Let me go this way. Where's your blessing? Oh, praise God. Yes, Lord. Lord just dropped in my spirit. You, you know, you hear Brother Bob talking about football and all that. What's that got to do with the Bible? Okay, let me give you an example. Elijah. <laughs> oh, man. I got a, I got, like, I think I taught on this uh, just on Elijah for like a month before. The quick summary of this part the Lord just dropped in my spirit book of Elijah he's told to go and tell King Ahab it's not going to rain till I say so that's what the Lord wanted to say it's not going to hey King I mean imagine you walking up to the President of the United States first how do you get access to him I mean there's a secret service and, and you know he's got layer upon layer of people you got to go through just to get into the same building and you just, you know, he's out at some event, and you just come walking up to him, walking right through the security. How? Because God anointed you to do it. And you get up there, and he says, who, who are you? Says, I'm a prophet from the Most High God, and I'm telling you right now, King or Mr. President, it's not going to rain in the United States till I say so. And then he turned around and walked off. Now, if you were the king, what's the first thing you're going to do? Talk to one of yours and say, who's that guy? Right? He knew he was a prophet because he announced himself as a prophet of God. He's dressed like a prophet of God. 
and Ahab and Queen Jezebel had been killing all the prophets of God that they could find. So how'd this guy get into my office? How'd this guy come get three feet away from me and none of you guys stopped him? Because God brought him in there, right? They said, who is that guy? Some nut. All right, they go out about their business. And drought is hitting this land hard. There's been no rain at all from one end of this land to the other. And then the king remembers this, you know, several months later, as this drought's really kicking in. He says, you know, that prophet, he said it wasn't going to rain until he said, i got to find this guy. i got to make him release the rain. i got, I got to do it. So they start a search far and wide. Now, Elijah, after he said it, you know, God told him, go see the king, say this. And when he got done saying it, God didn't pat him on the back and say, good job, Elijah, you're awesome. Now, go ahead and go home, kick back, take care of it. I'll send some money your way to pay you for your, your problems this day. No. God said, run, boy, run. He told Elijah, he said, I've prepared a place for you in the wilderness by the brook Corinth. Go over there and I'll provide for you. I've commanded birds to come bring you uh, meat and bread day and night, morning and evening. And you just stay there because they're going to come hunting for you. And I'm going to protect you there. Now, Elijah, you know, he may have said, Lord, <laughs> I don't want to leave my family. I don't. I got a nice house. You want me to go sleep in the woods, out in the, you know, this deserted place with nobody else around, so far out in the sticks that you got to have birds fly in food for me? Ah, I don't think so. I'm going to stay in my house. Thank you very much. And that would have been Elijah's decision. But where was Elijah's blessing at? Those birds been dropping meat and bread night and day, right there where it's supposed to be, out by the brook Corinth. Elijah's be back here suffering the effects of the drought. He wouldn't have water to drink. He had to brook where the blessing was. He didn't, wouldn't have anything to eat because nothing's growing and all the animals are dying. God was having the birds bring him meat and bread. Where was the blessing at? And the title of the series that I did on this teaching is called Your Place Called There. All right? Your blessing is there where you are supposed to be. Just like that receiver. He could have been the hero of the game. If he'd have been where he was told to go. Instead, he decided, you know, it looks like there's more of an open field down this way. I'm going to cut across. But when he cuts across, the quarterback is throwing the blessing, that football, to where he's supposed to be, where he was told to go. And it missed. The blessing landed where it was there, but there was nobody there to receive it. Elijah could have stayed in his apartment or in his house or you know, with friends or whatever, but the blessing was being delivered to where he was supposed to be. The provision was there. The place called there. Elijah knew that. That's why he went there. And in the midst of the drought, he had water to drink and food to eat. But when the effects of the drought became so significant that the brook dried up, notice he didn't move. He said, I'm not moving. I know this running brook is getting smaller and smaller. Now it's just a trickle. And now I see nothing but mud. The water dried up. I'm not moving. God said, this is my place called there. This is where the blessing is. I'm not moving. And then God one day said, okay, I've called a widow woman to take care of you over this other country. Go over there. Now, Elijah had to walk through the land. To get to where he needed to be, where that woman, the widow woman, her son was. He's seen the effects of his pronouncement of the drought. He's seen people suffering, dead people, dead animals, no crops, everything barren. And he knew it was his pronouncement of God's curse upon that land that there was not going to be one drop of rainfall till he said so. He could have said, God, I'm releasing this land from my profession now. Let it rain, God. No, he didn't do that. He kept going to his next blessing place, which is called there. I've commanded a widow woman there to take care of you. She suffered from the drought too. He gets over to where she's at. She's never seen him. He's never seen her. The Bible says as he's approaching the outskirts of town, she's out there collecting sticks. It says, you the widow woman? She looked at him and said, you the prophet? Yep. Well, I'm the widow woman. But I ain't got nothing to give you. Matter of fact, 
all I got left is this little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And I'm getting these sticks so I can go in and make this last little biscuit for my son and I. And after we eat that, we're just going to die because that's all there is. And Elijah said, tell you what, go fix me part of that biscuit first. And then you'll be provided for. And she obeyed. How many of you would take that last half a biscuit out of your baby's mouth to give it to some prophet that you never even met before, to give it to your preacher? You know, you're going to church, and all you got is $3 to your name. And the preacher says, you know, if you believe this sermon today, you believe God will provide for you, you believe blah, 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 like that. And all you got is $3. You know that's all you got because you counted it before you left. That's all I was going to give a dollar because then the other two I'm going to buy a, you know, a candy bar on the way home. That's all my son's going to eat the rest of this week. And the preacher says, give $2 of the three to God. Oh, take food out of my baby's mouth. Who's this preacher? Thing? He doesn't need my $2. I need my $2. He don't need $2. God's trying to get you to see if you give to him first, the blessings open up. Amen. And when that widow woman did that, the scripture says that the oil did not fail and the meal did not fail until the drought was over. And then what happened? Elijah went back to hunt down the king again. King's been trying to find this guy all along. And Elijah gets into town and, you know, uh, Obadiah sees him. Hey, Elijah, what you doing here? I mean, he says, I'm back to see the king. Tell Ahab I'm here. You know, he's been hunting for you. He's going to kill you if he sees you. Tell that old fox I'm here. Go tell him. <coughs> tell him, matter of fact, tell him to meet me over here and to have all the, you know. So he goes over there and, and Ahab comes. Ahab's where? He goes up and finds him. He goes, you're the one causing all this problem. And Ahab flipped it right over. I said, it wasn't me. It's you. You're the problem. He goes, you want to prove it? Go get all the prophets of Baal and all your 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 priests and stuff and, and bring them over to, to the mountain and we'll have a contest right there. And Elijah stood up and said, you know, whosoever God answers by fire, let him be God. If Baal's God, serve him. If Jehovah's God, serve him. But we'll have a contest. And, and you know about the contest. The, the priests and all them cutting themselves and jumping up and down and Nothing but silence. Elijah soaks. Now, remember, this is the midst of a drought. How precious is this water? And Elijah's dumping it on this fire, on this on this altar. Digging a trench around, filling the trench up with water. And everyone's standing around, you know, their tongue sticking to the roof of their mouth because they're so thirsty, right? He's wasting all this water. And then God said, or Elijah said, God, show everyone that you're God. And poof! The fire came down from heaven, consumed the altar, licked up all the water, and everyone fell in the face. Jehovah is God. And they said, kill all those prophets. Kill all those priests. And then he's walking into town. <sighs> beat, he even beat Ahab's horses and chariot back to town. And Jezebel finds out about it, sends him a letter. It says, as you did to those prophets of mine, I'm going to do to you. And instead of standing in the faith saying, praise God, bring it on, woman. Instead, he turned around and ran. Ran for like 30 days into a cave and told God, take my life, God. And God's answer every time he said that was, Elijah, why are you here? Why did God ask him, why are you here? Because the blessing was back there. He had left the blessing. Elijah, why are you here? Because everyone wants to kill me, I'm the only one left. There's nobody else but me. Elijah, why are you here? The blessing is back there. I told you where the blessing was. Oh, but you don't understand, God. I mean, he was in this little pity party, this self-pity party. Finally, God said, all right, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to like Elisha to be your replacement. And Baba and gave him all the instructions. He gave him like five, six things to do. He only went and did one. He anointed Elisha to be his replacement. And then that was it, right? Elisha's the one who had to take on everything and do, clean up Elijah's mess. 
The point I'm trying to make in all this is God had already provided for Elijah. A place called there. You have a place called there where the blessing of the Lord is waiting for you to arrive. And when you arrive, that's where the blessing is. You are there. God's work can be done. You've heard me talk about moving from Texas to Maryland. I didn't, I drug my feet, I was dragging, you know, holding, they're t- pulling me by the legs. I've got my hands trying to hold onto the dirt in Texas because I didn't want to leave Texas. But the blessing was in Maryland. I do not like Maryland. I don't appreciate Maryland politics. I don't like the city. I don't like the life here. I don't like anything about Maryland except. This is where the blessing is for me. This is where God said, you will serve me here. And this is where I'm at. And people ask me, when you come back to Texas? When God tells me to. He's told me to come to Maryland. This is where our blessing is at. As soon as I got here, you know, like a week later, I had a good job. A couple months after that, I had a better job. A few months later, I had an even better job. A year or so later, I became a cop and, and our pension's taken care of. All these things is because... God drug me from Texas to Maryland. Amen. He finally got me to the point where I said, okay, I'll go. I'll go. And as soon as I obeyed, the blessings opened up. That's why I won't leave. I'm like Elijah at the, at the brook Corinth. You know, he said, I don't care if this brook dries up or not. I'm not leaving because this is where God said I need to be. And he didn't leave. Even though the brook dried up, he said, I'm not moving. God, the last word I had from God on this was here. And that's where I'm at. I'm in Maryland. I'm here. And look at what he's done. Our ministry, I mean, not only has the blessing been upon me with the job and the career, the pension and all this, health benefits, all that stuff that is in the natural, but this ministry would not be in existence right now if I was not here. This ministry would not be reaching you right now if I was not here. This ministry would not be going around the world right now, impacting people all over the world. If I was not here, if I'd have packed up when I retired and moved to Texas or Michigan or wherever, I can almost guarantee this ministry would not be doing what it's doing right now. And we are reaching people in 160 plus nations every single day, 24 hours a day with the radio station. Our podcast has been rated number well, in the top half percent out of 2.7 million podcasts in the world. We are helping people to get the word out that are called to do so. We help them to do that. So many people are being impacted because this is where God wants me to be. And this is where we stay. Praise the Lord. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Amen. Again, go back to Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. No, not now. It says those spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ. But they are in you because you are in Christ. Amen? Which is what the very next verse says. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You know, Philemon 6 is another verse that explains this truth. Paul was praying that the communication of your faith may become effectual. That means that your faith will begin to work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. See, every good thing is in you in Christ. You've already got it. And he said he would never leave you nor forsake you. So instead of praying, Lord, just be with me this week, if it be your will for Jesus' sake. Oh, I hate that phrase. Don't get me started on faithless prayer, if it be thy will for Jesus' sake and all that. I taught on that about a month ago. It's total insubordination to God and his word when you say that as part of your prayer, but I'm not going to get off on that now. Or you say, oh, God, where are you? God, could you just love me? God, I don't feel the love of God. No. Pray, thank you, Father, that you'll never leave me. Thank you that you're always here in me. Thank you for your goodness that's shed abroad in my heart. You just start acknowledging the good things that the Word says are in you, and your faith becomes effective again. You'll start seeing things manifest in your life. That is so much easier than begging and pleading God to do something, especially when He's already done it. 
Amen? God has already done his part. When Jesus died on that cross, he said, it is finished. Right? The scripture reveals in Ephesians 1.20 that he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He's not working anymore. He's already done it. It is finished. Do you need to be healed today? It's already done. Jesus bore your stripes in his body 2,000 plus years ago. Do you need to be saved? It says in 1 John 2.2 2, that he is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's already forgiven the sins of the entire world, but people are still going to hell because they refuse to receive it. It's not a matter of if God will forgive you. He's already forgiven sins if you receive his forgiveness. Will you put faith in what Jesus has already done? That's the real issue here. God has already forgiven you. He's already healed you. He's already commanded his blessing upon you, upon your health and your finances. He's already given you his love, joy, and peace. You don't need God to respond to you. You need to learn to respond to God. Oh, shout, oh, shout amen somebody. Glory to God. It's easier to defend something you already have than to go get something you don't have. This is so powerful, but this is where so many Christians are missing it. They know God can do all these things. They just don't think he's done anything yet for them. They start from a position of unbelief. They're crossways with the word of God. In regards to healing, the proper way to do it is take Proverbs say, 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and begin to release the power over sickness and disease. I speak death to this sickness. I curse this sickness and command it to leave. God, I speak the life you've already put on the inside of me. I release this life to flow through my body. This is how you start cooperating with God and his word, amen? We need to begin to believe that the things that have happened that we can't see, taste, hear, smell, we, we need to believe these things have already happened. We can believe there's television and radio signals in the atmosphere, right? Even if we can't see them, we know all we have to do is go over, turn on the TV, turn it to the channel we want, and boom, there it is, because the signals are there the whole time. But we need to begin to apply this to our spiritual life as well. We cannot limit this concept to just our physical realm. There's more going on than just what you can perceive with your five senses. There's more than your soulish, emotional realm. There is a spirit on the inside of you in the spiritual realm where God has already done his part. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for you right now. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord, this is your chance to do so. If you've been born again but kind of slipped into unbelief, as I outlined today, let's repent of that and get back in step with God. He's here. He's ready to help you to get in step with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I come before your throne this day of grace and mercy that we may obtain grace and find mercy to help in our time of need. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, if someone listening to me right now has not received him as their Savior, I pray they repent of their sins and ask you to come into their heart, Christ Jesus, and create in them this new man, one that loves God, one that's called according to your purpose. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. If you pray that prayer with me, email with brotherbob at ftfm.org. Till next time, be blessed in all that you do.